Hello and welcome to Lab to Launch, the new seminar series for researchers interested in pursuing entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Sarah Jane Murdoch, Administrative Project Coordinator for the Institute for in Innovation and Entrepreneurship at UT Dallas and the Operations Manager for the Venture Mentoring Service of North Texas. Joining us today is Brian Chambers. Brian Chambers is the VP of Capital Factories Accelerator and a general partner in the Capital Factories VC Fund, the most active VC fund in Texas. Prior to joining Capital Factory, Brian helped to establish the Blackstone Launchpad and the UT Dallas Seed Fund at the University of Texas at Dallas, where he actively advises students, entrepreneurs, and early stage ventures and serves as a member of the entrepreneurship faculty. Brian was a founding team member at Fixed Repair, acquired by ANGI Home Services, an insurance technology and home services business where he led the business and corporate development strategy. Brian has spent his career working with and investing in venture-backed startups, including Reach Local, IPO'd in 2010, and Level Up, which was acquired by Grubhub in 2018. And now, here's Brian Chambers. Thanks, SJ. Wonderful. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, just a very quick introduction on the UT Dallas Seed Fund and also uh, on Capital Factory. Uh, we started the Seed Fund in 2016. To date, uh, we've had about 71 students who have joined this venture capital practicum, and we've made eight uh, investments to date. Uh, we invest exclusively in technology startups founded by UT Dallas students, faculty, staff, and alumni, so perhaps quite relevant for uh, those on the call today. Um, we focus on early stage businesses with inventions, discoveries, or products uh, that are ready for uh, commercial development. And uh, just a very quick announcement, the fall 2020 applications will be opening soon. And with that, we actually have a, a very new um, program underneath the seed fund that we're very excited to launch in partnership with uh, the Office of Research, which is a research and commercialization track uh, in addition to uh, funding the types of businesses that we have today, which have been mostly computer science driven. Um, so we are looking at making a substantial award. We think that will be uh, perhaps around the hundred thousand dollars for uh, for those working to commercialize new technology out of the university. Uh, very quickly, uh, Capital Factory is the center of gravity for entrepreneurs in Texas, which is the number one uh, state for startups uh, in the country. Um, we have boots on the ground in Dallas, Austin, and Houston. And I just wanted to uh, help the audience understand some of the context about what, what it might mean to be the most active VC in Texas. Well, we're currently investing out of what we call Fund 6. Uh, we have been since November of 2019, and we've made 19 investments uh, here in 2020 year to date. But if we look back into 2018 and 2019, we made 69 investments in 2018 and 70 investments in 2019. That is a whole lot of investments, so upwards of really 160, 170 transactions uh, I've been a part of um, in the last two and a half years. Um, and something that's very unique is, is having all that data really gives uh, our team, our fund, our organization, or what we call a complete view of the market from our unique perspective. We co-invest. Uh, something unique about Capital Factory is we're what we call a follow-on investor opposed to a lead investor. Often a lead investor is simply those who decide to underwrite the deal, um, organize all the due diligence, the data room, uh, and negotiate the terms. Uh, we, we do not play that role. We, we typically play a role assisting uh, companies and uh, early stage startups with uh, figuring out all that, all those details, but we follow on. So when it's uh, Chicago Ventures or Floodgate or Founders Fund writing the first check, we put money right beside them and we, we are a follow-on investor in early stage Texas technology companies. So today uh, in this seminar, what we'll examine, uh, and I hope that the audience will walk away with four things in particular. Um, one, what professional investors uh, expect when they make an investment and thus really what uh, an entrepreneur should also expect. Um, the types of early stage investment structures that will be uh, suitable or desirable for you, uh, how professional investors evaluate early stage opportunities. We'll actually take a real look at, uh, at a simulation for an investor and uh, the top reasons why VCs will pass on a deal. I also welcome any questions uh, along the way. If, uh, if you wanna include those in the chat, SJ, feel free to interrupt me at any time and we'll, uh, we'll be sure to try to address the questions. 
first and foremost, the, the first piece of advice I often give people is don't build a business dependent on somebody else's capital. Uh, businesses really should always be uh, always have a way and a methodology to always be making progress. And this is this is more um, figurative than, than literal, if you will. Uh, many times we, we, we are very dependent on other people's resources, but this is really a mindset uh, that all entrepreneurs, I think, should adopt uh, and be ready to make progress even without uh, capital from an investor. Um, so be have a plan, be prepared, and be making progress. And that's really something that investors always want to see uh, along the way. And so oftentimes, um, you know, the types of uh, ob objections I hear uh, along the way include, well, we can't start if we don't have the proper capital. We can't accomplish much without capital. Uh, or sometimes I'll look at projections for a business and it will say fiscal year one starts or won't have a particular date associated with it, month one, month two, month three. Sometimes these are, I, I would even go as, as far as to say, sometimes these, these can be pet peeves for investors. Uh, investors want to know there's a real plan, there's real dates, and businesses are, uh, and founders are committed to pursuing their business, their journey, uh, and working on their problem with or without their capital. And so I think that's a really important, um, it's an important mindset to have uh, and you can, uh, I would be very careful about the, the subtleties of communicating that you are not that committed. And these are sometimes some ways that, that entrepreneurs will do that. Managing a successful fundraise requires a very comprehensive strategy to uh, relationship management. Um, if you run a, a willy-nilly fundraise, you're going to get willy-nilly results. Um, so these are really, uh, for somebody to, to run an effective fundraise, it really does require um, a blitz and a very carefully managed comprehensive communication strategy. So um, doing outreach and tracking that outreach, uh, did somebody respond? How long did it take them to respond? Um, and building those types, uh, building that those data sets so you know uh, who you've communicated to, what those results were, and, and, and aggregating all of that information in a in an Excel spreadsheet or a CRM that you might be utilizing uh, will yield much better results than uh, than not tracking this information. Um, it's really hard. It takes a number of months and sometimes even years to complete a fundraise. And it's very difficult. Get ready for no. Uh, no happens for a variety of reasons. Um, and I assure you those who who will embark on a, on a professional fundraise will will get uh, 10 or 100 times the no's uh, that they get yeses. So it's just part of the process and, and be ready for it. Each one of them is a learning experience. Don't create a fantasy. Um, you know, this isn't easy and it doesn't go fast. Um, a lot of times uh, people will think that they'll take an investor meeting, they'll pitch and they'll be ready to close a deal. That is not how the process typically works. There are obviously exceptions um, all along the way to, uh, you know, to this guidance uh, about fundraising uh, that you'll hear today, but um, for the most part, investors like to build extensive and lengthy relationships. Sometimes they'll watch and track a business for one year, two years, and sometimes beyond that, uh, just to get gain familiarity uh, with a particular company or an opportunity. So start early. Um, even I would go as, as far as to say, even every fundraise, every great fundraise has a pre-fundraise campaign where the entrepreneurs are organizing the documents, organizing the information, organizing their investor lists, and getting ready for a highly coordinated uh, campaign. Building investor relationships, it just takes a lot of time. Um, and lastly, uh, something, to else, something also to keep in mind is that um, it's really important that entrepreneurs don't uh, inflate the value of what they think their idea is or their intellectual property may be. Uh, we see this a, n a number of times and there's a fine line between uh, cocky and, conf and confident. Um, we'll always encourage entrepreneurs to be very confident, um, but at the end of the day, this is a very, very competitive industry. It's a very competitive market and uh, oftentimes uh, people tend to inflate the value of what they think they're working on and that will not yield to, to great results. So keep that in mind. And so before somebody sets out and really begins on a fundraise, um, something that's really important to know and understand is, uh, is, your, 
is your mark is the market opportunity is your is the idea and the company that somebody's setting out to build is it even big enough for the venture capital industry i have been um humbled over the course of my career and still learn this lesson uh as i talk to the some many of the tier one and work with and, and co-invest with many of the tier one vcs um but this really to, to even it's a non-starter for uh firms like founders fund or graycroft if somebody is not even pursuing or they're not it's not evident that they're they're working in a multi multi-billion dollar market and so uh if somebody is working in a in a has a particular niche market that has 200 and they're going to carve out a piece of the market in a 250 million dollar market I can assure you that as as awesome as that opportunity might be and as successful as that business might be, it's not gonna pass the muster for uh, traditional uh, and tier, especially tier one VCs, uh, just because the opportunity itself is, is not big enough. So um, something else that you're gonna really need to be prepared to do is to convince uh, professional investors, including angels, that um, you and your team are the most capable and competitive in your entire field and that your craft that there's nobody better in the world to pursue this than than you and your team and uh, and that you have the capability and you've got a clear path to uh, winning uh, a sliver of a meaningful sliver of market share in a multi billion dollar market. So those are going to be um, the requirements that that uh, um, get investors excited enough to take a second, third and, and, and beyond meeting. So to successfully fundraise a couple of things that you'll need to know how to do is to leverage your network to quote unquote get meetings um, it is very true that investors uh, usually like to take meetings that have been uh, that, have, that where there's social evidence or social proof that uh, an idea or an opportunity has been qualified by somebody in their network and so um, to start you know grow your network uh, feel free to reach out to people like myself and others at the institute for innovation and entrepreneurship who have connections with vcs and can you know, speak or be timely about making an introduction when it's appropriate. Um, be familiar with uh, investor etiquette and best practices. Uh, and a good example of that, despite the, um, by, by one example, um, the 170 transactions I've been a part of over the last two, two and a half years, um, I only signed one NDA uh, in the course of uh, looking at thousands and thousands of opportunities, but, um, but actually completing uh, 200 and, you know, almost 200 transactions. Um, investors don't like to sign NDAs uh, just to hear or see an opportunity. And um, that's just one good example of uh, just a best practice as you uh, as you communicate with investors, just be aware. Um, it's a bit off putting to sign NDAs. There are certainly times and exceptions when it does make sense. The one uh, time I did sign an NDA in uh, in those transactions, um, it was actually Angie's Home Services, who SJ had mentioned uh, earlier, which was a competitor to my past business. Who, uh, who was acquiring uh, our business. We thought that was sensitive enough that we really needed to be protected, uh, to be protected there. So that was the one NDA that I um, intentionally, uh, we intentionally put in place. You'll need to determine the right investment structure. You'll need to know how to value your business competitively, and you'll need to know how to manage what we call a fully diluted cap table. So, and the cap table is uh, is simply an ownership schedule. It's the story of what happens over time with ownership as people come on and off of your cap table, they become owners and uh, or not um, owning uh, stock or equity in a particular business. So this is a schedule of, um, of somebody who uh, picks up some shares or earns some shares or might purchase some shares. And then what happens over time, they can sell their shares or their shares might not vest along the way. So it's the story of who owns what and over what time and what did they pay or what did they earn or how much did they earn. So other requirements uh, to begin really a successful and be successful with a fundraise, you're going to need a legal foundation for your company. Um, I always like to tell businesses and, and entrepreneurs to stay in the middle of the fairway. It really increases optionality for businesses as they set out on a fundraise. And um, this means that you'll likely have to form a Delaware C Corporation or a C Corporation. You'll need to make sure all your intellectual property assignments are in place and your founder vesting agreements are in place, that you'll have a very clean cap table that nobody's refuting or there's um, uh, um, any differences that people may, may believe should exist in the cap table. 
Um, things like in, an incentive stock option plan for employees will need to be in place. Of course, any uh, IP licensing agreement in place with the university. All this legal foundation really needs to be buttoned up and, and be in place. Um, other requirements, the uh, investors will want to know that the founders or executives of the business are dedicated to building the venture and the team is working full time. Um, I, I've highlighted this in red and suggest uh, really to everybody here that really 99 out of 100 times investors are going to want to see this first. Uh, it's very, very rare that investors will fund or make a funding commitment ahead of a team's commitment to a venture. Uh, so in that, I, th I can think of one or two scenarios where it would be normal for somebody to make an, an, a commitment to fund a deal or express interest funding a deal. Um, they would have to have you know, pretty extensive history with a particular founder or a team uh, to be comfortable doing that. Um, and so uh, there will also need to be proof of a problem or validation of, of product market fit, even if a business is pre-launched. There's substantial research and customer discovery experiments that uh, founders can be doing to uh, to provide evidence that this is a real problem, there's a real market, and, and people are excited about the solution. Um, something else that, uh, that will be really important uh, are the comprehension of what we refer to as unit economics in a business. Unit economics um, really are a, uh, a very nice snapshot of what the business model will be or should look like for a particular opportunity. This includes what we call a total addressable market or really what we what uh, investors really like to see is a service obtainable market. Uh, CAC standing for a cost for uh, to acquire a customer and lifetime value. Once you win a customer, um, what are they actually worth? So if, you, if it costs $100 to acquire a customer, do you assume that you'll keep them over four years and you're going to earn $500 off the lifetime of that customer before there's attrition or they turn. Those are the unit economics that will really be, you know, need to be substantiated to really understand, is this a viable business model? How quickly can it grow and scale? And what will the margins ultimately look like? And then at the, of course, you'll need a venture competitive investment offering. So how does your opportunity compare? If an investor is investing a million dollars versus some other random opportunity, um, it will need to be quite competitive in the grand scheme of things. SJ, let me take a quick pause and see if there's any questions that have come up along the way. If not, we'll just keep going. Uh, we do have a couple of just more general questions. Sure. If you want to take those now. OK, uh, for Cam uh, Cameron wants to know if we they can get a copy of the slides. Sure, I don't suspect that'll be a problem. OK, so we can send those out to the registered attendees um, later this week. Uh, Jim Ramsey, Ramsey wants to ask, what changes have you seen in the startup investing industry in the era of COVID-19? And what changes are you seeing with startups themselves in this pandemic environment? Yeah, great question, Jim. Uh, thanks for being here. It's good to, good to hear, hear you, hear from you, of course. Um, you know, Jim, um, we saw a great pause uh, and I think that that pause has has um, has has lapsed. Uh, we're seeing lots of deals finally start to get done again, but I think until people really understood where was the capitulation point in all of this, people didn't need to make investing decisions in, in very in highly risky businesses. And so things just came to a, a, a nice, what, what I call the great pause in, in venture. Something that we're keenly aware of is in 2018 and 2019, more limited partners made commitments to venture funds than, than in the last 15 years, which means there's more money sitting on the sidelines ready and available to be deployed than it has in quite some time. So while the pauses occurred, uh, it, reasonably so as uh, as we try to figure out which businesses are going to make it and which aren't and what's the you know world going to look like what's going to come from the stay at home economy uh, that money must get to work otherwise it will artificially compress uh, internal rates of returns for venture funds so it can only sit on the sideline for so long and i think that we're starting to see that happen that that cash is uh, is, is starting to go back to work um, at the rate and the pace that we we generally expected. So no obvious surprises. Internally at Capital Factory, we created something that we call a COVID impact score. And that's really simple. Um, it basically just means 
are you negatively affected? Is it business as usual or are you positively affected and, and your business might be surging because you had a video conferencing app or a, uh, or a workforce collaboration app? Um, while I think there's few sectors that are really fall into the category of positively affected and surging, it, it's your time uh, if that was you. And, uh, and those businesses were, were quick to capitalize and grab some market share and, and garner interest from investors. And I found some success but for the majority of businesses, I think the, the overwhelming majority are probably negatively impacted um, or it's business as usual. And those are really going to be the ones that it's going to take, a, a you know, are going to have to work harder or might even be dying faster. It's already hard to build a, build a startup. And I think that this particular um, scenario that we're in is going to kill more startups faster uh, than a typical entrepreneurial environment. So I think that's, you know, that's also something that that we're seeing as well. So. Um, SJ, were there any, uh, any other questions or should we go ahead and move on? We, we do have more questions. They are more general in nature if you want to keep going. Great. So first and foremost, I think it's very important for uh, a founder or the CEO, usually the same, same thing. Uh, the CEO is almost always the chief fundraiser in a business. It's typically expected to know who are you talking to? Who, who are you seeking money from? Um, just really start out. There's something that I don't think existed five, eight, 10 years ago, the way that it does today is there is overwhelming support and opportunity around pitch competitions or accelerators uh, that are either take equity or are non-dilutive and free like Mass Challenge or various grant programs that are now funding innovation at unprecedented rates. These are some of the most obvious and, uh, and places to look for entrepreneurs to be resourceful. And I think it's super important that um, that founders uh, deeply consider um, taking advantages of, of all of these. If there's two things that I can say that um, uh, two common characteristics, uh, common denominators across all of the, the founders and the startups that I've looked at, I've invested in or passed on along the way that um, that have been successful, I would say entrepreneurs have two common traits. They're highly resourceful. They know how to go get and access opportunities and resources where others cannot. And they're quite emotionally intelligent people. They really know and have a good sense of how to listen to customers or how to listen to investors and engage, um, you know, in, engage in those types of conversations. So uh, with that in mind, um, be resourceful, uh, explore competitions, accelerators, grant programs, NSF grants, SIBRs, uh, and and I think uh, there'll be a world of opportunity there. Um, can get loans. Uh, I've skipped over that. I've highlighted the ones I feel like will be most relevant. Friends and family. Uh, these are going to be people who are exactly that. They're, they want to see you succeed. They don't probably care how much about uh, how, what's the valuation uh, of the business or what exactly are the terms. They're really invested in your success. Uh, if you know whether you you have this network. Uh, of friends and family that can invest disposable income or not. Uh, it's it's always the first place to turn. Um, secondly, will be angels. Uh, the angel, luckily, the angel community in Texas is quite big, and D Dallas Fort Worth, it's it's strong and getting stronger. But the way I like to describe an angel um, is versus a professional investor, if you will, is angels typically wake up and every day they do something. They wake up every day and they might be a managing partner at Deloitte and, they, and, and they've had a wonderful career with Deloitte and that's afforded them the opportunity to make, uh, to have disposable income, to make angel investments along the way. And they might make one or two a year or you know, a couple a year. Um, but I would think about that. They manage their own money and they wake up every single day with, uh, with a particular career direction and they have a hobby of uh, and an interest in here and there putting some capital to work. They don't answer to anybody, so it's very easy to deal with them and uh, and to get decisions. Um, VCs, unlike angels, VCs invest other people's money. There are very strict processes, guidelines, due diligence requirements. All of a sudden, if I'm investing somebody else's money, you better be sure I'm going to I'm going to follow all of those rules, the entire investment thesis and, and really make sure I'm being a good steward of somebody else's capital. So the first thing to really ask is, is the person that I'm talking to, do they represent their own money 
or do they represent somebody else's money? And there'll be a very different process that ensues as a result of whatever that answer may be. Um, much easier to raise money from angels than, than professional investors. Um, other types of investors include family offices. Private equity is uh, plays much farther uh, up the stack um, as well. SJ, any questions we want to stop and address or? Uh, one quick question is where can they find more information about the fall application? I'm assuming they're referring to the seed fund. Yes, great question. Well, first of all, um, you can email probably anybody on this call. Uh, it hasn't been released yet, um, but it will be, um, I suspect in the next week or two, we'll be making it public. There'll be a public announcement. Um, so hang tight. And if you don't see anything, you can follow up with me directly or follow up with anybody at, at the Institute staff or um, a part of the Office of Research team, and we'll be sure to direct you. Uh, always go to innovation.utdallas.edu. Um, and we include a ton of links there as well, including this one where you can find a, a slew of resources, including um, details about um, the opportunities opening up with the seed fund. And I put that link in the chat. Um, we'll do another question. In terms of team commitment, a lot of entrepreneurs start something, quote unquote, on the side with the intent to move full time after some traction. How does that dynamic work if you approach VCs just before leaving a full-time role? And also, how does that relate to potential conflict of interest with full-time role after you've moved on? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. And it's absolutely true. This happens all the time. But I think that that period where you are, you, you've got one foot in two different businesses is the opportunity to build relationships, not to ask for money. That is really the most appropriate uh, I think the most appropriate way to um, and most mature way to manage the opportunity. So it's, you know, building relationships with angels or VCs, uh, exposing them and you know, transparently exposing them to the progress and what's happening, communicating uh, your plan and your path to, to, um, to move and to do this full time and letting that story unfold before somebody is a great way to build trust to build transparency, to give them um, insider knowledge about a particular opportunity. Um, the hard part is to actually get it to go and to experience the types of exciting results and progress that an investor is going to want to see uh, to get them excited. Um, you know, when you're doing it part time, you you definitely have um, limited resources. And so it's, uh, you know, it's just it's the nature of, of the chicken and the egg problem and, and, and when it comes to investing and the nature of the, just how hard this really is, find a way to make that progress and then expose various investors to that story and that narrative along the way so that when they see you jump and they see you make that transition, it's something that is exciting and is an opportunity for them to participate in. Really, investors require three things as you begin to work with them. You need to know this. They, they really require trust to do business with somebody, to wire somebody $100,000 or a million dollars requires a deep, deep amount of trust with somebody. Um, it also requires investment alignment. Don't pitch me uh, oil and gas extraction technology if I am clean tech to my core. Uh, that's, not, that's, not a, that's not alignment uh, across the thesis or an opportunity. So be sure that you have alignment before you pitch somebody. And of course, um, make sure you're pitching a, a competitive investment offering. Uh, we'll talk about that a, a little bit more along the way. And so building trust, um, you know, we talked about uh, an opportunity to do that maybe even while you're working part time. Um, bootstrapping a company is uh, is is absolutely um, something to res that investors respect. Uh, along the way that um, it is not a concern if somebody has got a full time job and they've got something on the side that they're they're working on that they're building and they're using the proceeds from their full time gig to fund or to pay for what they're building on the side. Hopefully that's an opportunity to again you, hard to ask for money in that environment. Great. It's the opportune time to build relationships and to treat those relationships as if they are the people that are going to be your investors, share your progress, share your traction, share your goals. And most importantly, over two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine months in that journey, do what you say you're going to do. That's the number one thing that I think will happen over the course of uh, an investor observing you that will build trust. 
I know Tim does what he does what he says he's going to do every single time. Um, and uh, and I've observed that and so much that I, I have the utmost uh, trust for Tim. Right. And so, you know, I think it, it just it takes time and it takes patience, um, but it's something you can be very diligent about along the way. Um, I'll go through this slide, SJ. We'll take some more questions after this one. Fundraising is an art. Uh, it's very, very hard, but there's three rules uh, or best tips for kind of best practices that I have um, that I have used and I have been an investor in when other people do this. And I can tell you it tends to create a lot of excitement uh, around an opportunity. And first and foremost, that's a confused mind will always say no. I actually learned this from a uh, gentleman also at UT Dallas, Mr. Chris Bhatti, uh, who um, manages a lot of uh, a lot of very important donors for the university. And this is um, simply a saying that means do not underestimate the power of simplicity. ABCs, one, two, threes. This is how it always starts. But what I really mean is that even investors, um, whether they're stakeholders, board members, mentors, other employees, aren't going to be the, you know, oftentimes aren't aren't the people that raise their hand and say, wait, 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 I don't get it. Can you repeat that again? Or what about this? They'll oftentimes they'll shake their head and nod like like they actually understand. But the second they walk out of the room and they say, well, I didn't really fully get X or Y, that means that's a no. That's translated into a no right then and there. So do not underestimate the power of simplicity. Keep the opportunity and be you know, fundamental to ABCs, one, two, threes, and use that as an opportunity to go deep uh, along the way. Create an exclusive opportunity. Um, this is, you know, this is, uh, can be as simple as as really the saying or the meaning if it's if the opportunity is for everybody that's not the opportunity that i really want to invest in i want to invest in the rarest and the best opportunities along the way if you think about this psychologically like a sale uh, of a piece of clothing you walk into your favorite store um walk into a i don't you know i don't even know what physical stores are, are exi exist and operating right now but let's say you you go to your uh, you go walk into your favorite store. I'll use Nordstrom's by way of example, and there's nothing on sale. That's not going to create an uh, and a real exciting opportunity to to buy something unless you absolutely need it. But all of a sudden, you're sitting right there, and somebody walks up and says, "Hey, we own these are the only ones that we have." And since you're watching me, I'm putting 50% tags on 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 these eight items. You're the first person to see that's going to create uh, an opportunity for you. You know, if you're going to walk away, you might lose that opportunity. That's also what we call information arbitrage. It's yesterday's terms on tomorrow's information. So that's that opportunity right there is going to is going to cause you to act. And so um, along the way, you got to build demand um, so much as to even, uh, you know, the best entrepreneurs, the best founders will actually co-interview their investors as they as they take the time to build uh, and explain the opportunity and build relationships over time. They tell their investors, hey, as soon as we declare that we're fundraising, we'll be the first to let you know as long as you're interested um, and uh, and you think it's a fit. We, we've liked our discussions with you so far. We think you could add a lot of value. Is it OK if we keep you informed? And that's not um, that's not alarming. That doesn't put pressure of making a decision on that investor. And it's a really uh, nice way to finesse building building a relationship or building an opportunity. And then along the way, you can, you know, report to me and use that information, um, you know, use progress to to, inf you know, inform me about the exciting uh, aspects of of, uh, of your business and, and the traction that you have going on. And then what I call put an ace on the table that gets me really excited. Um, this is how you really leverage yesterday's terms on tomorrow's information. If you come to me and you say, Brian, oh my gosh, look at this amazing contract that we've got. Uh, we're signing it. Like we we just got, you know, we just got the signature in uh, or whatever. Like, look at this awesome agreement. And um, that's a moment. That's an opportunity. That's what I call an ace. There's lots of ways to create aces and not all aces are created equal. Um, you can have a team member join. You can have an executive member join, a board member join. You can win. I mean, the best aces, in my opinion, are ones that create revenue. 
uh, or perhaps when you get a lead investor, that's also an ace to the rest of your follow on investors uh, that you can put on the table. And so um, I implore everybody to consider using their aces strategically and not just running to LinkedIn or running to Facebook and uh, pushing a press release out about it. That tends to deleverage uh, people becomes every day's information, everyone's information, not information that you can leverage. Um, so SJ, why don't we take a question or two and we can. Yeah, that's a really, really good tip. Um, so the next question is from Babic. What are the most prominent angel investment meetings with pitching opportunities? Well, those, um, you know, those, those are going to be self curated. The, the best ones are the ones that are, you know, are curated. Uh, and oftentimes you don't, you, you might not even know that they're happening, you know, candidly, but they are, um, you know, they're not, they're not forums where you can go and, and pitch a ton of, a ton of angels. Many of those exist. The um, Capital Factory has an incredible angel network and, and puts, opportunities together to present to many of those, the Houston Angel Network, but CTAN um, is one of the best angel networks, Central Texas Angel Network, and, and they office principally out of Austin, and we're in a ton of different deals with them, um, but that's a wonderful forum um, to get uh, exposure to a ton of different angels. Uh, there, another quick question from Dr. Danny Fada. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brian, for this talk. Our UTD students generate amazing ideas of products and businesses, but they do not know how to proceed. What examples of legal paperwork, business plans, or access to legal resources can we show them to develop a legal foundation and move their ideas from dreams to plans? Okay, so maybe not quite such a quick question, but. Yeah, well, um, Dr. Fada, thank you so much for being here. It's it's great to hear from you. Uh, I always in, in, enjoy visiting in your classes as well. And, and I think you're right, our students have incredible ideas uh and and opportunities um and so uh really what i would say that the you know you you've asked a, a fully loaded question um but there are many resources that exist upon simply searching uh we're we're so lucky at the institute and at ut dallas i didn't have the resources that when i went to school that exist that are available for students today they can simply email um you know email anybody at the uh, at the Blackstone Launchpad, and we're going to start pointing to those resources. We have uh, we have attorneys who regularly show up and uh, and do mentorship sessions with us. Um, but generally, it will depend on the type of business and the type of opportunity, and then there'll be kind of a standard framework um, that will exist. And I covered some of those earlier in here, and happy to you know happy to discuss those, or perhaps do a seminar on any of them, uh, or or help do a seminar in any of them with a particular uh, um, attorney. And I cannot even believe we're 40 minutes into this yeah. and um, and halfway through. So I'm going to need to skip a number of a number of different slides. But this is a big question. How much is your business worth? Or when you ask when somebody asks that question, they're also asking, what's your pre money valuation or your valuation cap? And um, I want to I want to get to that in a particular example, but you're going to have to know how to answer. Um, what's your business worth? What's your AKA? What's your pre money valuation? Um, and so, uh, again, the goal isn't to the goal isn't to begin with the highest valuation. It's to end with the highest valuation. Um, one of the worst things I could uh, suggest somebody do is to start with a really, really high valuation. That makes it very, very hard uh, to succeed and to uh, to build a positive culture where investors are really happy. Um, um, it's similar to this. A good deal isn't good enough. You've got to really have the best deal, the best opportunity. Um, you might see three houses in the same neighborhood tangential to UT Dallas, and one of them is priced at $300,000, and it feels like there's, you know, there, it's a good deal, but the same one might just have a pool. It might have a unique feature. It might be $1.5 million. I can assure you you're not buying that home, and you might go look at the 200, this home that's $250,000, and they need to get a deal done quickly, and they'd like to move out, and my gosh, it has a pool too. Right, so you're going to clearly choose the best and most competitive. Um, but what I want you to think about is every neighborhood and every house has a set of peer comparables that they're compared to largely in the same area. They go to the same schools. It's the same price per square foot at, you know, use as as peer comparables. Well, every business has a set of peer comparables also. And so if you play in the telecommunication space and you build an artificial intelligence, technology leveraged by you know enterprises to help x look 
Well, there's a whole pond of businesses that do exactly that, that have comparables that the industry or you can reference or look to. They're quite hard to find. Investors and, and uh, prominent investors will always know them, um, but uh, you should do your research. Um, a couple of different valuation methodologies. Uh, asset value. Um, this isn't really the one that we should talk about because that's really when something needs to be liquidated, prop, uh, plant property equipment, IP inventory. It's usually very, very little salvageable value, but a multiple of EBITDA, that's going to be a services company, an accounting firm, a law firm, a doctor's practice, what have you. Uh, things get tend to get pretty exciting when we talk about um, trailing 12 month revenue, TTM, or a multiple on what we call monthly reoccurring revenue or annual reoccurring revenue. Sometimes if the revenue isn't reoccurring, um, it can be called ARR, annual run rate revenue. And then um, the most exciting businesses that have tons of, of high innovation and lots of growth will get a multiple on what we call future revenue. So if you intend to make, oh my gosh, we're gonna, but we're gonna make uh, from July through December, we're gonna make five times what we made previously, well, as long as you can convince me that that's legitimate and that's true, I'll give you the benefit of that future revenue and I'll value your business on future revenue. And that's a bit of the holy grail in, in venture. Um, let's go ahead and skip that slide. Uh, three, um, I'll get through this slide and then and then take a, a, take a quick break. Uh, we'll answer any additional questions. There are th primarily three early stage investment structures to consider uh, for entrepreneurs. One, you can sell equity in your business, straight equity. Um, this is done in what we call a series seed or a series A investment offering. They're really complex and they're very expensive. There is 101 decisions, if not 500, that somebody will need to make along the way. Uh, what should the liquidation preference be? Is there going to be a dividend yield? Who's going to get board seats and why? And how do we vote? Every time somebody sells equity in a round with Series C, Series A, Series B, Series C, these are terms uh, you might have heard of, you essentially restructure the company and it costs a lot of money. I would personally not suggest going down this route unless the target fundraise is $2 million or more. You wouldn't want to spend $50,000 to complete a transaction, which is generally, I think, what it would take to do a two million to do to do a meaningful series uh, seed round or series A round, you wouldn't want, you know, ten percent of the proceeds going to pay the legal bill. Um, so uh, recently, there's been over the past several years, there's been two additional investment structures that have been created: convertible debt or something that we call a safe, a simple agreement for future equity, which allows all of that confusing, complex stuff to be determined later by professional investors. Meanwhile, angels or even early stage professional investors can feel comfortable and confident making quick, simple decisions without restructuring an entire company or combing through every single provision in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in an operating agreement. And, um, and they can just do these simple, kind of engage in these simple investment off, uh, uh, offerings and when Graycroft or Founders Fund or Andreessen Horowitz or Silverton or whomever it may be decides to write a $5 million check later and uh, and defines all these things that they're going to come back and retroactively apply to the investor with the exception of the valuation because I made an investment now and first I'll get a better deal or I'll get a discount on the opportunity later. I'm going to try to do this through the lens of an investor. If I was making an investment decision today, let's, let's play off of the example that um, that there was this B2B software company uh, that Tim Reeser was the founder of, and he uh, it's a, an emerging tech AI company. Well, we know that those companies sell for anywhere from six times to 12 times annual reoccurring revenue. So let's use eight, eight times since it's in the middle. So if the company is making 50K in monthly reoccurring revenue, we multiply that by 12, that means if nothing substantially changes, that company is going to produce $600,000 in revenue uh, over the course of an annual year. Well, with $600,000 in revenue, we take we can take that eight times revenue multiple, and we would understand that the business might it might be fair for the business to get a $4.8 million uh, a pre money valuation. So hope everybody's following me there. And then, so what do the investors get? 
Well, let's say the investors invest in the AI company. Uh, the company is going to raise a $2 million round at that 4.8 pre-money valuation. Well, the post-money valuation is simply equal to what was the what did uh, what was the pre-money valuation versus the total amount of investment equals the post-money valuation. So 4.8 plus the investors $2 million equals $6.8 million post-money valuation. And then simply take the invested capital, $2 million, divided by the post-money valuation, and the investors collectively are going to own 29.41% of that business. So I'm going to run through this very quickly because it's how an investor will actually make a decision at an, an early stage business like the one we're talking about. Well, if if we were leading the, one, the $2 million round with a $1 million check, we would effectively get half of those shares, so 14.7% would go to the lead investor and the rest of the investors would take the rest. We're gonna ask ourselves, do we think the business can achieve $20 million in annual reoccurring revenue within a five year time frame? And such this would yield an eight times revenue multiple, which would mean that uh, the company could sell for $160 million. How much capital, then we're gonna ask ourselves, how much capital would it take for that business to get there? Well. Let's assume it would take another investment round. We just, the company raised $2 million, but it's going to take another $5 million in a subsequent round. And then again, after that, a $10 million, uh, $10 million of additional financing. So 15 together in, in addition to this two. Well, each one of those rounds, the company is going to sell approximately 25%. Uh, 20 to 25% is, is normal dilution. It's how much the average round is sold uh, when somebody raises capital. Well, my 14% is going to be multiplied by 0.75. It's going to bring me to 11% after the first round of dilution. And then that again, that 11% is going to be multiplied by 0.75 again to bring me to 8.3%. So my 14.7% after 15 additional million dollars of investment is now worth 8.3%. So um, What's the potential outlook if you know if the business actually has 13 million in annual run rate revenue or annual recurring revenue and sells for eight times, then it would sell for 104 million dollars, um, which means that uh, absent of any debt or liquidation preferences along the way, um, that investors uh, that me my my one million dollars I would earn a 8.6 times multiple on invested capital. That's what MOIC stands for, a multiple. On invested capital. Well, if it feels like this is an achievable uh, outcome uh, because of the, the revenue target and the diluted equity position really meets the, the 10x that we were going for uh, or was close to it, we would then um, substantiate the valuation and we would decide to invest. So that's one way to really think about how do you back into a professional investor getting what they want out of an early stage investment. I'm going to go ahead and stop there and I'll take some questions. Actually, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time, talent and resources, Brian. We really appreciate it. Of course. Uh, so please join us two weeks from today. Uh, I'm going to be welcoming Connie Manns, the CEO of Qualia Inc. to our next Lab to Launch seminar, which will be July 27th. Uh, there's an announcement in the Q&A section for the link to view the complete seminar schedule and to register. Have a great afternoon, everyone.